Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 45 Demon War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Minors. When feelings of neglect and abandonment plague a child, they can manifest later in senseless, tragic ways. Being constantly pushed aside or even outright abandoned by a parent can cause a stunting of emotional growth in a child, perhaps making it easier to take a human life for granted. On this episode of Murderous Minors, we cover a case that reminds you you can find yourself in the path of a rage-filled individual and fall victim to circumstance, even when you're just trying to help. This was true in 2009 for Greg and Marguerite Guff of Lovett, Indiana, who had devoted many years of their life to intervening in the lives of boys around their community. Their home often offered refuge for short and long periods of time to kids who just needed somewhere to be. Greg tuned pianos and organs for a living and had for decades. Tuner, as he was known, was an accomplished musician as early as high school, having won the John Philip Sousa Band Award as a teen, then was a President's Music Scholarship recipient at DePaul University. As a professional, he tuned and traveled with the Boston Symphony as well as for the Boston Pops, Liberace, and Elvis Presley. He married Marguerite Raybar in her hometown of New York City. She loved animals, cooking, needlepoint, reading, and church. The couple raised four children back in Indiana, active in their church congregation and music fellowship, omnipresent in the community as a safe haven for youth. Greg had a backyard firing range and used target practice and teaching responsible gun ownership as methods of bonding with the kids. They lived together and died together. One of those kids the Goffs had tried to protect was Ryan Taylor Renfro, who was 17 years old in 2009. By September, the teen found himself homeless, a child alone. He seemed like a decent kid. He had friends at school and was a good student. Then living in Columbus, Indiana, and playing football at Columbus East High School, he lacked a strong home life. His parents had an abusive relationship, and his mother had fled from Lovett with Ryan by her side. Remarried and living in Columbus, she kicked Ryan out in the late summer days of 2009. There was a family friend, whom Ryan referred to as an uncle, who was willing to try and be there for the boy. But Ryan was more than he could handle, and soon found himself turned out of a warm home again. He found a friend to give him a ride back to Lovett from Columbus, about 30 miles away. He'd grown up there before his parents divorced, and it was a place he remembered he felt safe. On Monday, September 14th, he made it to Lovett, stopping first at the home of childhood friend Luke and his grandmother. It was reported later that Ryan began asking around to see if he could get a gun. He slept over at Luke and his grandma's that night, nothing seemed to miss, although he did search for driving directions on their computer to Texas. Then he was gone, heading for Greg and Marguerite's rural home. Was he seeking refuge or something they would be less willing to hand over? 
The Guffs warmly welcomed Ryan into their home, and they soon went out to the shooting range for chit-chat and target practice. Greg owned a Chevy Camaro that a neighbor would later recall seeing an unknown teen having a test drive in. As dinner time rolled around, Greg and Ryan head inside to clean the guns before they sat down with Marguerite. As instruction on the cleaning process began, Ryan would later say that he heard a demon, a voice in his head tell him to kill Greg. And just like that, 69-year-old Tuner Goff was shot twice in the head, killed with his own gun. Ryan then went directly to wheelchair-bound Marguerite and used the laser sight to take aim and shoot her once in the back of the head. She was 65 years old. He rummaged through Greg's pockets and Marguerite's purse, using it to hold the money, car keys, and handguns that he was taking with him. Back in the Camaro, on a dark and unfamiliar road, only minutes pass before Ryan crashes the car into a ditch. In the accident, some of the bullets fall onto the floorboard. Ryan is able to hitch a ride to the nearby TA truck stop at US-50 and I-65. A state trooper is dispatched to the scene of the car accident, and he's able to see the ammo on the floor. A man drove by and let him know where he'd drop Ryan off. Troopers make contact, and though he isn't nervous or anxious, what Ryan was telling the trooper wasn't making sense. Car trouble, a sister's wedding, something about Texas. While the trooper spoke to Ryan at the truck stop, just questioning him about leaving the scene of an accident, the plates on the red 1987 Camaro are traced back to the Goff residence. This couple is not who was in the car. A sheriff's deputy arrived at the scene and discovered the couple had been murdered. Troopers at the truck stop hear over the radio that there's an active homicide scene at the Goff home and that Ryan is their suspect. He can hear the radio, too, and he makes a run for it, but is intercepted by a second deputy, who had just arrived to help get him into custody safely. As he's handcuffed, a gun is visible on him, and this is when Ryan Renfro states that he had just shot two people, and that the voice of a demon plagued him, commanding him to kill Greg Goff. Under interrogation, he told investigators that although he had been previously diagnosed as bipolar, he readily admitted to not adhering to his medication regimen. As for Marguerite's death, Ryan says that he killed her because she wouldn't present favorable testimony on his behalf. He said she'd be a shitty witness. But not only does Ryan tell detectives that he heard a demon say kill him, he also claimed that Tuner Goff made a sexual pass at him. On September 18, 2009, 17-year-old Ryan Renfro was charged as an adult with two counts of murder, two counts of robbery, auto theft, and failure to stop after an accident. In no time, the teen befriended two other young violent offenders in the Jennings County lockup. Cellmate 17-year-old James Smith jailed on theft charges for robbing his own grandmother, and 19-year-old Roger Bushhorn Jr., locked up for armed robbery in another county, share a wall with Ryan. This apparently made it easy for the three to plot and scheme, seemingly unnoticed. Just three weeks later, while Ryan was awaiting trial, they attempt a brutal jailbreak. The three devised a plan to sweet-talk and manipulate a female corrections officer into letting them out. They waited to implement their plan until she was on duty. They felt her motherly instincts would soften her attitude toward their requests, and they were correct to an extent. As they empty their trash and James uses the bathroom, Roger asks to use the bathroom. The guard declined and tried to get them locked back in. The pair take the opportunity to overpower her and make their way out of the cell. They've made shanks from clothes hangers and they use them to threaten her and get her keys, radio, and mace. 
Ryan is released from his cell as the inmates start to try and get the attention of the other corrections officers. They handcuff her, pull and push her into the hallway, up to the door that leads outside to freedom. Roger is threatening over the radio to stab this guard if the door is not opened, but it doesn't budge. The guard is down on the ground and the stabbing begins in a frenzy. It's three against one and James Smith doesn't hold back. Before she's stabbed to death, two other guards finally come to her aid. One of the guards is stabbed in the chest and the head, then takes a vicious beating especially for a man of his age. The pair drew attention away from their co-worker, who managed to scoot herself out of harm's way. The guards were maced and handcuffed. The door to the outside finally opened, but instead of being able to escape to freedom, state troopers swarm the hall, not even realizing what they're charging into. Officers subdued the teens with tasers. Ryan's jailhouse buddy Roger gave investigators all of the details and was charged with kidnapping, criminal confinement, and attempted escape. The kidnapping charge will keep him in jail the longest until at least 2028. Had he not attempted escape, his original charges out of Ripley and Decatur counties would have seen him released in 2011. 17-year-old James Smith's charges of battery, kidnapping, attempted murder, and armed robbery will have him locked up until at least 2044. Ryan Renfro hadn't even gone to trial yet for the senseless murders of Tuner and Marguerite Guff at the time of the jailbreak attempt. The state charged him with felony escape and at the same time offered him a plea agreement leading Ryan to plead guilty to the murder and escape charges on December 16, 2009. Two months later, 17-year-old Ryan Renfro received three consecutive sentences, 58 years for Greg's murder, 60 years for the murder of Marguerite, and six years for the attempted escape, for a total of 124 years with his first parole eligibility coming in 2074. Not one person came to court in support of Ryan Renfro. The defense appealed, trying desperately to get Ryan's sentence reduced any way they could. The appeal asserted that the original court abused its discretion in the disposition of such a lengthy sentence, saying it was, quote, inappropriate in light of the nature of the offenses and his character. In the appeal response, the court upheld all of its decisions, highlighting that the crime was premeditated and heinous. The reply unequivocally states that insufficient evidence was presented at trial to link Ryan's mental illness diagnoses to the actual commission of the crimes. The appeal reads in part, quote, as far as the proffered mitigating circumstance of Renfro's deteriorating mental state, we agree that there was evidence presented that Renfro was taking medications and that he had at some point been diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder, bipolar disorder, and depression. However, Renfro did not demonstrate that he was unable to control his behavior due to any type of mental illness nor did he demonstrate any nexus between alleged mental illness and the commission of the crime. Accordingly, although mental illness is a mitigating factor to be considered and given significant weight under certain circumstances, such circumstances are not present here. The appeals court also found that there was no corroborating evidence to support the claim that Greg Goff had made unwanted sexual advances toward Ryan, thus allegedly instigating his and Marguerite's murders. The court pointed out that those driving directions to Texas were printed before Ryan ended up at the Goffs to kill them and steal their car. The court then spoke to Ryan's character, saying, quote, we disagree with Renfro that the trial court improperly considered his lack of a high school diploma as an aggravating circumstance. Our review of the record indicates that the trial court was merely considering Renfro.